Thank you very much, Javed. And uh, of course, thank you to the organizers for uh, arranging this wonderful meeting and for inviting me to it. Um, so this is work done in collaboration with uh, various people, <laughs> most of whom are here. Uh, so there's Omar al Fala, who's already been mentioned in another talk, Karim, Javad, Emmanuel. Um, Uh, so, uh, in this talk, D will be the open unit disk, and X will be simply a, a Banach space of holomorphic functions on D. So, the only thing I assume about X is that uh, convergence in the norm of X implies pointwise convergence at each point of the open unit disk. And I'm going to be interested in approximation questions. So, here are a couple of questions that you might ask. Are polynomials dense in X? So actually, I'm not assuming that all the polynomials are in X, but what I'm interested in is, are those that are in X, are they dense? And here's another question, which looks as if it's the same thing. Given F in X, find the sequence of polynomials Pn such that Pn converges to F in the norm. Um, but actually there is a, a difference between the two questions. In the second question, we're interested in finding an explicit sequence, a formula. And in fact, in this talk, I'm really interested in the second type of problem. I'll call that constructive approximation. So uh, I want to illustrate this with a, a few examples. So to, to warm up, here's a really easy example, a Hardy space, H2. And polynomials are dense in this space, and one way to prove it, probably the simplest, is just to expand the function as a Taylor series and truncate it. And if I call Sn the truncation up to z to the n, then obviously the Sn's are polynomials, and they converge to f in the norm of the space, as this proves. Um, so in fact, exactly the same argument works in any weighted Hardy type space. So that takes care of uh, other familiar examples like the Bergman space or the, the Dirichlet space. And another thing you might try is varying the two in the H2 and asking about HP. So it turns out that in HP also the partial sums converge to F in the norm, uh, at least if P is strictly between one and infinity. Here the proof is a little bit different. The, the standard way to do this is to write Sn as a slightly cunning formula combining the power of the shift and the Riesz projection. I haven't written it out, but there's a very simple formula for it. And knowing that the Riesz projection is a bounded operator from LP into HP, and knowing that the, the shift is an isometry, uh, it's very easy to see from that that the Sn's form of a sequence of operators that are uniformly bounded in, in norm, and that's enough to, knowing that the Fs are dense from other, some other way, that's enough to, to prove this result. So this uses the fact that the, the Riesz projection is continuous, so the proof does not go over to either p equals one or p equals infinity, and in fact the result is false there. I'll, I'll talk a bit more about H1 in just a moment. In H infinity, of course, the polynomials are not even dense, so you couldn't possibly hope that the Sns converge. In the case of H infinity, of course, there is a, a nice closed subspace in which the polynomials are dense, namely the disk algebra, and that's our second example. So I'll, I'll write A of D for the disk algebra, that's the functions holomorphic on D, continuous on the closed disk. Uh, so here the, the polynomials are dense, but in general it's not true that the Taylor partial sums converge in the norm. And this is very similar to a uh, uh, a well-known problem from the 19th century as to whether the Fourier series of a continuous function converges. And there's a very famous construction of dubois raymond uh, showing that there exists a continuous function whose Fourier series diverges at a, a point. And by adapting that in a very straightforward way, you can prove a similar uh, 
similar fact here. In fact, here we're asking for more than just pointwise convergence, we're even asking for uniform convergence. So the, the Dubois-Raymond example really proves even more than, than what, we're, what we're asking for. Uh, but of course, in the, the case of Fourier series, everybody knows that there's a nice way out of the problem, which is to take averages. So you take the average of the Taylor sums up to n. Uh, this is usually called sigma n, the Chisara means. And then the Chisara means do converge. And I mean, this is true for Fourier series, and it's just as true in the disk algebra as well, for much the same reason. OK, so um, <clears throat> there are other uh, holomorphic function spaces where there's a similar, similar phenomenon. So H1 that uh, I left in suspense a moment ago falls into this category. Uh, basically, there's an argument to show that if the SNs were uniformly bounded in norm, then the Riesz projection would be continuous, which it isn't. Therefore, they aren't. Therefore, you, you don't get convergence. But the, the Feyer argument still works here. And uh, another different class of spaces, these are Hilbert spaces, are the so-called local Dirichlet spaces. Uh, I'm not even going to define these or talk about them because uh, they're going to form the subject of part of Javad's talk tomorrow. So this is a, an advertisement for tomorrow. Uh, but these are actually Hilbert spaces. And there's the same phenomenon there. OK, so the third example is a little bit more complicated. So this is a family of Hilbert spaces called the bonge rovniak spaces. So they featured in at least one talk here, but uh, although there are several experts in the audience, perhaps not everyone is familiar with these, so I'm just going to give a kind of idiot's introduction to them, just one slide, just to say what the, what the basics are. So this is a family of uh, Hilbert spaces that is parameterized by uh, functions B in the unit ball of H infinity. And so to be in H of B, first of all, you have to belong to the Hardy space, H2. And then you look at this supremum that's uh, written on the right here. Uh, this thing has to be finite. So you take this, you, you uh, well, you can read it for yourselves. You take all the, the Gs in H2 and you ask this supremum should be finite. So this is the original definition of de Branche and Rovniak. It has the advantage that you can write it down in one line, but it's not at all transparent. Uh, it's not obvious that what you get is a vector space. It's not obvious that what you get, what I've defined here to be a, a norm is a norm, but it is. And in fact, it's even nicer than that. Uh, what you get is actually a Hilbert space with a reproducing kernel that you can write out explicitly. Um, it's actually not very difficult to, so this B here is exactly the same B that uh, is the parameter here. But it's not very difficult to see that uh, this function, as a function of two variables, is a positive definite function. And there's a theorem that says that given a positive definite function on a set, it is the reproducing kernel, sorry, it, it is the reproducing kernel of some reproducing, unique reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And so, in fact, you could even define H of B this way. So perhaps it's a more reasonable definition. And there are several other equivalent uh, definitions that one can give. Um, so one case where you can calculate quite explicitly what this space looks like is when B is an inner function. So inner function just means uh, bounded and modulus one almost everywhere on the boundary. And in that case, when you uh, calculate the supremum, well, if you expand this inner product, uh, expand this thing as an inner product, you get the norm of F squared plus the norm of G squared. The B disappears because it has modulus one on the boundary. And the norm of G squared cancels with that one. And then finally, there's a cross term, which is twice the real part of the inner product of F with BG. And the only way that that could be bounded, irrespective of G, <coughs> is if it's zero for all G. So necessarily, F has to be orthogonal to all things of the form BG as G runs through the Hardy space H2, which is the same as saying that F is in the orthogonal complement of BH2. So 
that's what you get. And then this is the, the norm in this case happens to be the, the Hardy space norm. So this is a very familiar object. It's the so-called uh, model subspace corresponding to B. It, was, it can be used to construct models for contractions. And in fact, the Bosch and Ravniak were also interested in doing that. That's one of the, one of the reasons they devised these spaces. Um, in general, the, the norm you get, this HB norm, this one, is not the same as the Hardy space norm, and H of B need not be closed in H2. It's contained in H2 contractively, but it may not be closed. Okay, so the thing we're interested in is density questions. So you can ask, are polynomials dense in H of B? And here's the answer. This is a theorem of Don Saracen. Uh, so they're dense if and only if B is a non-extreme point of the unit ball of H infinity. So remember the Bs that parameterize these things, they lie on the unit ball of H infinity. And Saracen proved that the, the polynomials are dense exactly when B is not an extreme point. And there's a way, an analytic way of characterizing being extreme or not in the unit ball of H infinity. And it's this condition here. So this is the condition that's equivalent to B not being extreme in, in the unit ball. Um, and actually, rather more than this is true. So in the case where this condition holds, all the polynomials are in HB and they're dense. And in the other case, when B is extreme, not only are the polynomials not dense, but very few of them are even in the space. It's just a finite dimensional set of polynomials. So there's really a, a sharp dichotomy between the two cases, and it's a dichotomy that really pervades a lot of this subject. Um, here's a, another more recent result um, that if you're interested in approximating by functions in the disk algebra, then you can always do it. Uh, so this is, this, you have more freedom for, for approximation. A recent theorem of Alexandru Aleman and Bartos Malman. Um, and both of these theorems, the, the proofs are non-constructive. They are proofs by duality. You assume that something or other is orthogonal to the, the approximating space and you prove that anything in your orthogonal complement is zero. And it gives you no clue about how to produce the approximants. And at least in the second case, this is, I find, very mysterious because it's actually quite hard to produce concrete examples of functions in H of B. And yet there are enough of them to, uh, that are continuous to approximate everything. It's not at all uh, easy to un understand. So um, anyway, the thing I want to ask is whether you can provide constructive methods for proving these theorems. So in the case of polynomial approximation, at least you have something to approximate by polynomials. So that's the case we looked at. And this is a theorem that shows that at least for some examples of the parameter B it can be problematic. So you can cook up an example of a B in the unit ball of H infinity, uh, which belongs to the case where the polynomials are dense. In other words, B is a non-extreme point. And, and a function in the space, H of B, with the property that if you dilate the function slightly, uh, so it's holomorphic on a larger disk, um, the dilates you can certainly approximate by their Taylor sums because the Taylor series converges very rapidly. So if, if the dilates are approximable, approximable, and if the dilates themselves approximate F nicely, you, your problem will be solved. But unfortunately, that's not the case. The, the dilates don't converge to F. They converge pointwise, but they don't converge in the norm. And worse still, their norms actually tend to infinity. Uh, that's quite nasty. Even though the limit function itself belongs to the space. And uh, from this, it's very easy to deduce that neither Sn nor sigma n of f can converge for this particular example. Um, so maybe 
using some cleverer method of sum summation than Chisara summation that might work, I don't know. It's this, uh, still a research in progress. But uh, there are other ways of performing constructions that will work, and here is one. <clears throat> so let's assume that we're in the case where polynomials are dense and that we have a function that we want to approximate by polynomials. So here's the recipe. It's a kind of two-step recipe. So the first step is to approximate f by polynomials in the Hardy space. That's easy to do. Uh, but we need to do it uh, at a specific rate. So I need them to be uh, 1 over n squared close. And then uh, we cook up this function hn. So uh, first of all, this thing here, 1 minus mod b squared, remember that this was the thing that has a property that log of it is integrable. That's the polynomial of the dense hypothesis. So this whole function here has the property that it's log integrable on the circle. And so I can construct an outer function whose modulus uh, is equal to this guy almost everywhere on the, on the circle. So I do that. And I don't want to write down the formula, but there is an explicit formula for what hn is on the, on the disk. There's no problem about that. And now I have these two sequences, the polynomials qn and the outer functions hn. And I look at the turplets operator with symbol hn bar, apply it to qn, and that gives me a new sequence of polynomials pn, and I claim that those polynomials converge to f in the norm. So this looks awful. Uh, it's not quite as bad as it looks because um, this turplets operator, and it's just given by an infinite matrix who constant on diagonals, of course, and the, the coefficients of the the Fourier coefficients of Hn uh, are, the, are the entries on the diagonal. So you can compute this quite explicitly. This is not a, a problem. So once you have the Fourier coefficients of Hn, the rest is, is fairly explicit. Um, but one has to say that one's left with a certain feeling of dissatisfaction with this. It's kind of messy. Um, and so now what I want to do is to take a step back and ask, uh, what's wrong with this? How could, what, what would we like about having an approximation scheme? So Javed and I uh, <coughs> did this. So now I'm going to uh, really go back to the beginning and just consider a general Banach space of holomorphic functions on the unit disk. So what we would like is something that's basically linear. So it's a we call a linear polynomial approximation scheme for x is just a sequence of bounded linear operators on x such that for every function in the space, t and f gives you a sequence of polynomials that converge to f. So for example, if we x was a disk algebra, we could take sigma n of f. That would do the trick nicely. And I mean, the name of the game is to, to try and produce a sequence of tn that works for lots of function spaces. And I don't think there's a, a general answer for something that's nice and explicit. It's obviously going to depend on the space. But we did wonder whether, in fact, Tn even exists. Must it always exist? Obviously, polynomials have to be dense if you're going to have a chance of constructing Tn. But is that enough? Uh, so here's the answer to that. So X admits such an approximation scheme if and only if X contains a, a dense subspace of polynomials. And it has to satisfy a second condition. And this is a condition on the, the geometry of the norm. Uh, X has to have the bounded approximation property. And that's if and only if. So I'm just going to digress slightly to recall what the bounded approximation property is. I'll come back to this in just a second. So uh, we're very familiar with the fact that in Hilbert spaces, compact operators can be approximated by finite, bounded finite rank operators. That's not necessarily the case on general Banach spaces. And the Banach spaces for which it is true are said to have the approximation property. And here's a, another reformulation of the, the same definition. So um, 
X, y has, well, Banach space Y has the approximation property if every, for every compact set K and Y and every epsilon, you can approximate the identity on Y uh, epsilon close by a uh, finite rank, bounded finite rank operator T. And there are all sorts of flavors of the approximation property. And the one that's going to interest us is the bounded approximation property, which is almost the same thing. Except, in addition, we insist that the, the norm of the operator T uh, is controlled by some constant independently of K and epsilon. So here are a few uh, basic facts about these properties. So whenever your Banach space has a Schauder basis, it automatically has the bounded approximation property, and therefore, obviously, the approximation property. Uh, for quite a long time, it was an open problem whether, in fact, every separable space had a shadow basis or not. And then there was a very famous example of n-flow to, to show that there was a space not only without a shadow basis, but even without the approximation property. Um, and uh, another interesting example is bounded operators on little l2, which is not a pathological space, but nonetheless it fails to have the approximation property. In this last case, the, the space here is of course not separable, whereas Enflow's example is, and, and what I'm going to talk about in a moment, I'm going to be interested in separable examples. So I, I don't know of any separable examples that are not constructed explicitly to be nasty, I mean, whether they come out naturally from something else, I don't know. Maybe someone in the audience does. Okay, so let me return to where we were. Um, there's one other little thing I can add to, to this last theorem. So if you can find a linear polynomial approximation scheme, then you can actually always choose it to have an extra property, namely that the polynomials T, N, F uh, have degree uniformly bounded by N, like all, all the examples we've seen up till now are at that property. Okay, well, I tried to impress upon you that it's kind of, I think it's quite of, kind of interesting that you have to have this property here, but you might say, well, uh, are you sure you really need that? Maybe the sort of spaces that we're dealing with, these X's, are so special that automatically they have the bounded approximation property every, anyway. We want a space of holomorphic functions, we want the polynomials to be in there, you want them to be dense. So maybe already it has the bounded approximation property. So that's the question. And the answer is no. So you really need it. Uh, and in fact, it's no in a very strong sense. So there exists, so sorry, start off with any uh, abstract, separable, infinite dimensional Banach space. And then I can manifest it as a Banach space of holomorphic functions, isometrically. Uh, and I can choose this to contain all the functions, all the polynomials, and even all the functions holomorphic on the neighborhood of the closed disk, and so that the polynomials are dense. And I didn't include it on the slide, but we can actually do a bit more than that. We can control, to a certain extent, the the norm of monomials, norm of z to the n. So, a um, couple of remarks on, uh, well, a remark, I guess. So if we take y to be the, the space of n flow, for example, then there exists a holomorphic Banach function space that's isometric to y, so it fails to have the approximation property. And so as a corollary, there really is a, it's one of these spaces in which polynomials are dense, but there is no linear polynomial approximation scheme, which is perhaps a bit surprising. Okay. Um, so I'd like to say a, a few words about the proofs of these results. So the, the first theorem um, actually is not really a theorem about complex analysis at all. It's nothing to do with polynomials or holomorphic functions. It's a pure, purely functional analysis result. 
And once you, it took us some time to realize that, but once you realize it, it, it becomes quite easy. So in that formulation, you, you take a, a Banach space Y, let Z be a subspace of Y with a, a countable Hamel basis, and then the following statements are equivalent. You can find a sequence of bounded linear maps from Y into Z, such that T and Y converges to Y for all Y. And that's equivalent to Y having the bounded approximation property and Z being dense in Y. So the, it's pretty easy to see that the original result is just a special case of this by taking Y to be the, the holomorphic function space and Z to be the polynomials. Uh, as to how you, you prove this abstract theorem, I, I don't really want to go into the details here, but I'll just mention one point where it was kind of the starting point, which is that um, when, you, when you have a, such a TN going from a Banach space into a space with a countable Hamel basis, there's a very uh, simple bare category argument that shows automatically T has to have finite rank. It's a nice exercise when you give a course in functional analysis. And so the TNs that come out of this process will automatically have finite rank, which in our context means that the T TN of F is a, always a polynomial of bounded degree, or the degree doesn't depend on, on F. And just by re-numbering re, um, them, you can arrange for the degree of TN F to be less than or equal to N. This explains the last statement in the theorem. Um, the other result, the thing I call the representation theorem, so that given an abstract Banach space, you can manifest it as a space of holomorphic functions. So this is based on a notion that I have to confess was new to me before I started this, and that's the, the idea of the so-called Markushevich basis. Maybe it's well known to you, but for me it was new. So this is a a sequence of uh, pairs En in Y and En star in the dual, which are biorthogonal in the obvious sense. En span a dense subset of Y, and the En stars span a weak star dense subspace of Y star. That's equivalent to saying that the En stars separate points of Y. And every Schauder basis is a Markushevich basis, but not vice versa. And the nice thing about Markushevich bases is that they always exist in a separable space. This is what Markushevich proved. And uh, in addition, there was a, this came a bit later, it was, whoops, it was proved by, uh, this was proved by um, Osvespian and Pelczynski, I think. You can choose the, the ENs uh, so that this condition holds. It's natural to consider the product here because of this biorthogonality condition. So if you multiply one, you have to divide the other by the same constant. Okay, so what's, what, what, why is this useful? Well, the idea is actually very simple. So we choose a, one of these bases and normalize it so that the en stars are equal to one. And then I define j by this formula. So to each element of our abstract Banach space y, I associate a power series whose coefficients are simply en star y. And since the, the en stars are of norm one, that means that these coefficients have to be bounded. So what we get is certainly a power series whose radius of convergence is at least one. Uh, so we're mapping y into this space. And this map is injective because if ever it gets mapped to zero function, well, that means all the coefficients have to be zero. And since the en stars separate points, that means y has to be zero. So this map uh, is an injection, and now we can just take x to be the image and transfer the norm using j. And the fact that the, the polynomials are dense in x comes out from the fact that the, the ENs, which will be mapped to the monomials, j of en gets mapped to z to the n, these span a dense subspace. So that's all it is. Okay, well, I'm going to finish a bit early. I apologize, but uh, there's a couple of references to. So, so I just want to ask a silly question so I can impress my program officer on my next NSF grant application. 
can you explain why polynomial approximation has something to do with mathematical physics, as in your second reference? Um, yes, it's, it was actually uh, um, part of a proceedings of a conference that uh, happened to be published in this journal, even though the conference was not in mathematical physics. But, uh. Maybe you were even there, actually. So it was in Ireland. Uh. If you consider your concept of uh, uh, admitting a linear uh, polynomial approximation scheme, in a nuclear Frechet space of holomorphic functions, uh, I think then at the second assumption of the bounded approximation property uh, will not be necessary because these spaces have the property. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, we instance, haven't thought about. <laughs> yeah. But of course, this is very different because nuclear spaces and Banach spaces. The intersection is only finite dimensional. Right. So this is somehow the opposite. We, we never thought about Frechet spaces. But the space of all holomorphic functions on the unit disk endowed with the compact open topology is, of course, such an example. Maybe I, I should add the, the reason. Sorry, Tom. Yeah. The, the reason we, we went for this abstract version, because I mean, Tom, myself, uh, Andreas, and even Manu, we are in love with HB spaces. So we wanted to, and still we cannot. Still we are not able to to find the constraints. It's it really, I mean, it's a complete failure, at least for me. Uh, we, we cannot do that. And the abstract is coming to tackle these HB spaces, because now, we, if you go back two years from now, we didn't know if such an approximation exists. Now we know it does, but we cannot find it. <laughs> <laughs> Any further? question or remark? That's time, Tom.